Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. This week, we're joined by Charlie Spears, strategy lead at Nakamoto, an Oklahoma-based company using stranded energy to mine Bitcoin. We talk about everything in Oklahoma, including stranded energy, how it differs from Texas, and energy infrastructure within the Sooner State. Charlie, welcome to the Compass Podcast. It's been a, a long time coming. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. And you know, I've been a fan of the Hash Rate Podcast, cut my teeth on that back in the day, and then, you know, transitioning it all to the Compass uh, and you taking the helm. Man, I'm a huge fan. I listen to almost every single one. That's good. To, that's good to hear. What's your favorite part? Was it the Hash Rate Podcast? Was it the live stream or what we got going now? Uh, bonus points if you say uh, me. I'm I'm a fan of the the new hot clips you post, the square, uh, you know, there we go. format. Um, because <laughs> I look, my life's gotten busier. I don't have time to listen to the whole thing anymore. If you can just figure mm-hmm. out what parts I care about, that's what I like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's like the the question for us media folk. We're like, what? How should I do this? It's like your own personal Twitter account, right? Everyone has their Twitter, and they're like trying to think about like how do I promote myself a little bit more. Yeah, and then you add like podcasting into it you add like a newsletter and then you're just constantly thinking about basically yourself so it's a little narcissistic but you're thinking about all these media products and how you can maximize them so yeah um well i'm a huge fan i love the research desk i love the team you guys got awesome yeah no and it's been great getting to know you through compass as well uh the conversation today mostly focuses on oklahoma and oklahoma bitcoin mining but of course we got to do an intro first just for our, our listeners so could you tee us up with uh, info about yourself, how you got into Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and uh, what you're doing over at Nakamoto, which again, as I said, right before we started here is the best name in Bitcoin mining. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, I don't know what, you know, divine inspiration came up to that, but I actually got to give Austin Storms, formerly of Great American Mining, now with Galaxy, uh, with, you know, the name he's given me uh, his goodwill to use the term Satoshi Nakamoto's motor. And then from SEO, Nakamoto, nobody's got it. There is some Japanese like gear manufacturing company, but <laughs> different jurisdiction. Yeah, no, uh, so good. yeah, Nakamoto is a Bitcoin mining company, but we come at it from an energy perspective. We're a small partnership. I have two other partners. Um, we all come from oil and gas and therefore our specific uh, main strategy is putting Bitcoin mines on gas wells. Uh, we are headquartered here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So most of our stuff is within a few hours drive of Tulsa, but you know, we're talking about Oklahoma mining. I'm very bullish that there's plenty of energy just in my back door, just my backyard to, uh, to put, you know, as far as the, as far as I can see enough, uh, Bitcoin mining on it. Personally, I'm an, an OG Bitcoiner. Um, I have my battle scars from Mount Gox and the block size wars and whatever else is going to come next. So I've seen it all. Um, y- you know, what's kind of interesting is the the whole being a Bitcoiner thing kind of incubated solitary for several years. I was not very, you know, I tell friends and family about it, but I don't, I don't proselytize as much. I'm not as public about it. Um, recently, about two or three years ago, I started trying to bootstrap more community engagement here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I now coordinate the Tulsa Bitcoin meetups. And uh, I'm kind of more on the forefront of engaging locally about that and promoting it. So, yeah. Awesome. Tell me about the transition from Bitcoiner to Bitcoin mining. Was it seamless? Did you always Bitcoin mine or back in back in the early days with maybe GPUs or TPUs? It wasn't seen. In fact, I'd, I, uh, I didn't really understand Bitcoin mining for four or five years. Um, and then during the block size wars, that was quite a come to Jesus moment personally. Um, I realized I didn't understand Bitcoin as well as I thought I did. I didn't have strong mental models for what, you know, how to make decisions in this space. As we're talking about block size, then it goes into the mechanics of mining and block producers or miners. And that's where I got really interested on the energy side. My family is uh, uh, 60 years in the oil and gas business, specifically market research. So we have a small family partnership uh, that does upstream oil and gas market research. So I've come from this world. Um, I kind of do what you do, Will, for Compass, but for Spears and Associates. And 
2017 rolls around. I'm getting into the idea of mining post block size wars. And I get, I'm enraptured by this energy side of it and the future of what that looks like. And so I realized, well, I got to learn how to uh, mine Bitcoin myself. And I've got to figure out how to put this on what I think is a major component of the future, which is on stranded energy. At the time, I was uh, obsessed with um, like the idea of flared gas mining, which is great, but I really want to kind of refine and broaden that term to what I see the future is, which is just kind of all um, energy that's not optimized. And so that's where the term Satoshi Nakamoto's motor comes in. Um, Because I think as the line between mining and energy production blur, it doesn't really make sense to, you know, distinguish Bitcoin mining as a separate practice, similar to how the internal combustion engine, we don't, it is revolutionary, but what it kicks off is how it's applied and integrated into the larger process of industrialization, I think we'll kind of analogize in the history books, Bitcoin mining as Satoshi Nakamoto's motor. So I love the the stranded gas part, and maybe that's not the most uh, conventional place to take the conversation, but I do want to pick it up because I think a lot of people who are getting into Bitcoin mining in the last few years, that include myself, I was more of an altcoiner and Bitcoiner, to be honest, um, but have found my way to Bitcoin mining. But we, the newer guys always kind of latch onto this flared gas idea, and it, you know you find it in Bloomberg headlines, you find it in Reuters headlines. It, they always look really great burning methane, helping the environment, powering and monetizing energy at the same time. Looks awesome. But anyone who I talked to in the oil and gas field, they're like, flared's great, but that's only part of the conversation and probably a pretty small part of the conversation, to be honest. Like there's so much energy out there in the oil and gas world that is not being flared, uh, that can be utilized for Bitcoin mining. And it, it's oh, it's refreshing to hear that from another person like yourself, but it's also interesting. So I'd like to get more from you on that line of question before we move on to Oklahoma. Like, what other energy sources are out there that people are just glancing over because they don't know enough about the industry? Yeah. Um, well, I can only really speak to oil and gas and just the abundance of of natural gas that needs to be run through a Bitcoin mine. Um, flare, I do. I love the flare uh, narrative. It, it looks great in news articles. Um, I do consider myself a bit heterodox because I come from oil and gas and I am concerned about uh, uh, the change to the climate. So I view reducing greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas output as a net good practice. Um, but I'm also a realist and my, my other two partners, specifically the, my, my partner, Kyle Drew, who's the reservoir engineer on the team, uh, He's also kind of agnostic to Bitcoin. We're, so he balances this, this out very nicely. Um, he uh, very early on uh, was like, Charlie, you know, the flare is a great idea. Technically, uh, it's going to be challenging from a deal structuring standpoint. It's going to be challenging. We are bullish on natural gas flaring being significantly reduced in the future. However, there's lower hanging fruit. And we don't really have anybody on our team uh, who's an expert on the carbon credit gaming system. So we're just going to try to, um, on the balance sheet, in real economic terms, actually make money. So we, you know, we do actively right now reduce some flaring, but the majority of our power comes from stranded gas. Um, that's where the opportunity is. You have to have consistent energy. Uh, you have to have consistent access to your on the well side, and you just find that more in stranded energy. In Oklahoma particularly, there's all these little kind of stripper wells. These are older, older well bores, you know, 20, 30, 50 years old even, which are just kind of vertical, shallow, comparatively uh, drilled wells that are late in their life cycle. And a lot of these are kind of structured or owned by small operators who for the past 10 years kind of got shafted on gas prices, not now. And uh, maybe they're beholden to a pipeline deal or they're kind of stuck there. Um, We can solve that for them. And so that's the low hanging fruit in our backyard in Oklahoma is just how many people can we convince to do a joint venture to put their gas through a well and uh, or put their gas through a mine and uh, make more money off of it. So that's kind of our pitch. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of companies like ours who 
do the w- mining at the well site deal. And it, they were throwing a lot of shit at the wall from the deal standpoint to the actual like legality of it all. And uh, we're trying to, you know, we're concerned about building a business model that lasts. So where our contracts are secure, where everybody's happy and nobody's getting burnt. Because in oil and gas, it's a small world and your reputation goes very far. So we're very concerned about uh, preserving that over the next decade. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I lied. One more question about yeah. all this before we move over to Oklahoma. Obviously, Bitcoin had a rough day uh, yesterday, and then <laughs> yeah. it's been downtrending since since December. I'm surprised anybody would ever watch this, given the fact that it's <laughs> is the least important thing happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, but maybe everyone just wants to like turn their head somewhere else for a little bit. I, yeah. I think I do. I want to talk about something else besides Luna and Terra and that whole <laughs> yeah. crapshoot. But looking at natural gas, obviously, that's been a huge line of discussion ever since the Russian invasion. All these European markets are looking for liquefied natural gas, and so they're importing it from the United States in many cases. A lot of these states are finding out that natural gas prices are going up and they don't have an infrastructure for it. That's causing like a general increase in the price of natural gas. Where do Bitcoin miners sit in that stack? Are some of them going to get squeezed because they didn't create good structures for themselves? Or for the most part, are these Bitcoin miners okay because they've been using more stranded energy or at least energy that can't find a, a good place to get from you know Texas to Washington, D.C. or Texas to, to California? I think it is, we're in a period of uh, uh, price discovery equivalent for miners in our, in our uh, type of the business. Um, the, I mean, so uh, Nakamoto and the and uh, my family's company, Spears Associates, were in the early stages of producing some primary research on this specific topic and the deals that we structure uh, at the well site. And it spans the range. Um, there's kind of two eras, I would say, in this world so far. One is the pre-China ban era. And that's when the price of Bitcoin isn't helping you. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody wants to be involved in it. So you, it's really hard to accomplish a joint venture with the operator. It's all it's hard to have any kind of arrangement where you're not just purchasing gas outright. Um, maybe tie it to NYMEX price. And so those deals, I think, are imagined are probably three to five years in length. And so uh, you know, they've been mining for a little bit, so they've probably had a nice return. Um, but post China ban and as producers become more amenable to joint ventures or like actually doing some kind of working interest on the mine, um, we've seen a lot more of those type of deals come out. Um, the NYMEX strip, if you, if you look at, so it's not just the gas prices today, which are working against you. It's the gas prices at the end of the year. Uh, all, all, all forward pricing is, has risen alongside uh, the spot pricing of natural gas. Which means that if that may, if that continues, and the market seems to have priced this out pretty well, I think that might be uh, accurate pricing of like seven bucks in December. Um, there's going to be a lot of miners who are bleeding, or the really what's going to happen, I think, is the operator is going to uh, just go out from under them and buy out their end of the deal, or start selling their gas back to the pipeline. And there's like people who built these mines, right, where there was no pipeline, but now the, it makes economic sense to build that. So the question is, can that pipeline deal get enough steel on the timeline to build it? I mean, I, you know, we'll see. I, I think we are in a huge period of churn uh, for kind of the first era of natural gas miners. A huge period of churn. I like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think... A lot of this stuff is going to have some some changes going to the summer. Uh, I don't know how much of this is true, but I've seen a lot of the shutdowns in China, especially Shanghai, have caused more repercussions and ripples for the larger market. And I expect that to to continue hitting the United States in terms of like getting pipeline to uh, an oil well. And then uh, demand doesn't seem to be slowing down in Eastern Europe. Maybe it gets a little easier right now, but then going to the summer months, you have demand for air conditioning, right? And you need a power source for that. So I think it's a it's kind of a rough situation either way. I'm curious to see how Bitcoin miners respond to this. 
Yeah, from your I, answer. I have I, no idea. I mean, look, I wanted to put Bitcoin mines on gas wells in Oklahoma. Now I have to be some kind of macroeconomist in order to be able to talk coherently about it. I mean, I'm willing to do that. That is the story of getting involved with Bitcoin and 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 uh, specifically mining. But yeah, now I have to have an opinion on you know uh, you know Germany's gas purchase from Russia in order to put a small half a megawatt mine down in rural Oklahoma, um, which I'm fine, but it's, it, it really d- requires you to be kind of a Renaissance man, just to be an mm. expert in all things in order to get these deals done. I also have to go, um, out, you know, I'm going to go put on my steel toes right after this and go out to the mine to redo some cabling. So like that is a, that is a standard day in my world. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. I think I consider you a Renaissance man, Charlie. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, don't, don't knock yourself down a little bit. Let's turn over to Oklahoma and let me set the table a little bit. I think we've had like a billion podcast guests on this show talking about Texas and West yeah. Texas energy markets. It's great. It does well for the podcast. And I think it does well for, for listeners who are really curious about Texas and for good reason, right? Uh, uh, the governor Abbott there has made a Texas a Bitcoin friendly state. He's pushed a lot of legislature that way. Um, the regulators over there, my understanding, especially ERCOT, are very pro Bitcoin. And there's lots of stranded energy from the energy decisions that were made a decade ago in Texas. So about a gigawatt plus, maybe a few gigawatts of Bitcoin mining are going to West Texas. Just to the north, Oklahoma, it's very similar. Mm-hmm demographics, very similar energy. It, it just seems like there's a political border there between two states. Uh, it, it even seems like that isn't even much of an issue because the regulatory stance is like considerably similar. Uh, Oklahoma hasn't gotten a lot of press though. Like I've seen a few things here or there, but like it hasn't gotten much attention. So that's my first question to you, Charlie, before we dig more into Oklahoma. Yeah. Why is there, why is no one paying attention to Oklahoma when there's so much Bitcoin mining happening in the state? I mean, you just wait. The uh, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. I mean, mm. we can look and see how Texas is doing this. If you remember, it was only it was a year ago this month that Governor Abbott tweeted, "We want to make Bitcoin mining a mecca, uh, or Texas a Bitcoin mining mecca for miners." Um, so this has been a, a very recent conversation. In we have such short memories, and the bureaucrats move at a glacial pace. Um, I think with the amount of money and uh, outside investment coming into Oklahoma, the some of the Oklahoma legislature are going to get wise real fast. We typically are a very pro-business state. We have our issues and our foibles, but um, we recognize money and tax revenue. So um, we get that. So in that case, we're, we're very similar to Texas. Um, I'm not really an expert on the Oklahoma grid. Uh, or Southwest Power Pool, those kind of dynamics. I can speak to oil and gas. And then once oil and gas sees this as a profitable thing, then that's when in Oklahoma City, our capital, that's when the ball gets rolling really quickly. And I think I would say we're six months to 12 months out from our governor tweeting, we want to make Oklahoma a Bitcoin mining mecca. Um, we'll see when Stitt uh, tweets that. Uh, so... Um, I'm very bullish on it. Uh, you see uh, North Northern Data putting in 150 megawatts or so. You see, um, this is yeah, this is public. Core Scientifics is looking at 500 megawatts in Muskogee. That's actually mm. not too far from one of our sites, which is a grid site but yeah. small. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have other, uh, I anticipate 100 megawatt or so projects, which I don't think are super public yet. Yeah. No, that is one thing I've learned is like, don't talk about other people's projects. Even yeah. though everything is like, everyone's going to the same place and they kind of know it. No one wants to talk yeah. about it. So I mean, I think careful. if you're a public miner, you're looking at Oklahoma right now. It seems yeah. pretty obvious. I'm not. I don't, I, you know, I, I beg for the scrappings of like five and 10 megawatt will serves from OG&E. But, uh, you know, those big guys who are looking to build their own substation and everything, I'm certain they're looking at Oklahoma. Yeah, let's dig into the why for that. And I, th- I think it comes down to the energy. So I'm grateful for for your expertise on this topic. What is different or similar about Oklahoma's energy basket, maybe compared to Texas or compared to the rest of the United States that makes Oklahoma an interesting spot for Bitcoin miners? And if I can interject really quickly before I let you get to that, 
ERCOT is always a thing people are talking about in yeah. Texas. Like ERCOT makes Texas viable. I don't always know if that's the case though, right? There's a lot of extra energy in Texas and that's basically like the other half of the answer, right? Is that the same with Oklahoma? They don't have ERCOT, but they have excess energy? <clears throat> I think so. Again, we're kind of on the boundary of what I, uh, of my expertise here. Um, we have a lot of wind energy. You know, Texas, I believe, depending on the month, is, you know, produces the largest amount of wind energy as by state. Oklahoma's like right up there. And um, we have some hydro. I mean, we have the Grand River Dam Authority in North, North, Northeast Oklahoma. Um, and we have a lot of natural gas and some coal. Um, I know that, you know, I, I, I only, you know, a lot of my information comes from the podcast here, so I'm just repeating it, but you <laughs> your strand energy in West Texas and a transmission problem off mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the state. I'm not aware that we have similar transmission issues in Oklahoma. I don't know if we have uh, as much availability of just giant chunks of power, but again, that's not my expertise. I'm very bullish on it. I think a lot of the people who are looking at Oklahoma are probably having those conversations right now. Um, in just the world of oil and gas, we have tons of energy in Oklahoma. That is our largest export. And um, I mean, Cushing is here. So that's our, that's the world's, in, you know, or uh, crude interconnect and the, the lion's share of our strategic uh, reserves which are a little bit less now than they were a year ago. Um, and so energy is Oklahoma. And because of that, uh, I'm, I'm just very bullish on it. I, I kind of, I've coined this term. So um, uh, Oklahoma University and Oklahoma State University have rivalries with Texas universities, football rivalries. I went to a neutral school. I went to the University of Tulsa. I don't have a dog in this fight. Don't really like football. Anyway, it's this whole thing, and it's called the Red River Rivalry, these, these, these games. And um, I like to coin this term the Red River Hash Rate Rivalry, where um, it's, a, it's a, you know, a playful, competitive engagement. Um, I don't necessarily think we'll compete against Texas. I think uh, regionally, Bitcoin mining as a narrative will um, kind of flywheel. Um, Especially because you know, you know, our our legislators go down there and they come up here, and everybody's involved in oil and gas, so they all know each other. But uh, I, I, you know, I want to see uh, where each state is by exit hash by the end of the decade. I would say we're going to be about even, if I could imagine, if I could just kind of throw a dart at the wall, I'll say we'll be about even by twenty thirty. With Texas, Texas. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's. It's a lot of hash rate. I mean, there's gigawatts of hash rate coming to West Texas, is my understanding. You think the same for Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what happens when you start routing all the pipelines through Oklahoma, uh, which already exists, the infrastructure's there. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if it's a pure energy play and the amount of energy flow in a state, um, then eventually some of that energy will be routed or a large part of it will be routed to mining. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we don't see mining happening off crude oil yet much, but, uh, we're, if we're talking like pipeline volumes of crude passing through a state, Oklahoma's like top of the list. So, um, we'll see. Yeah. I'd piss off a few ESG people if we were mining Bitcoin with crude <laughs> oil. I <laughs> think we'll also see a lot of, uh, wind. I mean, um, I talk to people who in, who, who complain all the time about uh, way too much wind en energy hitting the Oklahoma grid at a time and creating mm -hmm. these massive imbalances. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not a transmission issue, but maybe it's an overproduction. They don't know how to balance or synchronize the grid or whatever kind of magic they do there. Um, I think we'll, I, I think that will be uh, retroactively plugged into minery. Okay. Okay. So I want to turn the conversation a little bit over to the infrastructure side with, with Oklahoma. Uh, and do excuse me if we're pushing again the boundaries of expertise, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm curious just to follow up on that question. You said like there's, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but Oklahoma has a huge amount of pipeline and yeah. pushes so much crude oil and energy yeah. out there. What does this look for the infrastructure side for the oil and gas companies? Are they like really interested in helping out these miners? Is it more miners just talking with energy brokers uh, in the typical fashion and, and finding spots to lay down? 
It's all of that in the above. So we have pretty mature oil fields in the state. Um, we got a lot of uh, Woodford Shale, Anadarko, Arcoma. These are plays which where uh, operators have developed multiple times over the years, different formations. Um, they know these areas. And sometimes um, uh, these these are just absolute uh, nightmares from a from a uh, you know investment perspective. There's been a lot of capital destruction in Oklahoma, and even more so in Texas. But I think kind of like um, something happened in the late 2000s and early 2010s in oil and gas, which I think goes overlooked. Beyond just the uh, the hydraulic fracturing shale revolution, um, you also had an interesting. Um, event or period called the NGL revolution or natural gas liquids revolution, where um, as the North American market transitions from producing gas prior to 2000 into primarily producing crude oil, um, now gas becomes a byproduct at the well site. Um, but then we learn to extract of, of that natural gas mix, after the natural gas liquid mix, kind of discrete. Um, you know, components of it, like ethane, propane. Uh, and that takes something that the producers are already making and just significantly increases the bottom line retroactively. We use this analogy for Bitcoin mining to say, you are already producing this. It's kind of like a byproduct, maybe not today, but it was six months ago. And uh, this is a way to plug in and uh, increase your bottom line. And then that totally flips the economics of, of, uh, uh, every well you want to drill. And so I think if we apply that to the existing plays domestically here in our state, uh, we will, I think that's going to provide a lot of really creative uh, opportunities to, you know, spin up a company, drill upon this thesis. We have the late Aubrey McClendon who founded Chesapeake Energy. He's a famous mythical person in oil and gas. And he pioneered a certain way of kind of structuring these uh, joint sites and drilling these longer laterals and having more exposure to the production zone. Um, I think we'll see Aubrey, Aubrey McClendon types who uh, really embrace the Bitcoin mining uh, at the well site perspective. And we'll see a similar kind of iconic entrepreneurs in this part of the country over the next decade. You're talking about yourself. What are you talking about? No, go. no, he works too hard. I, I like to be on Twitter too much, man. <laughs> Me too. That's why I get nothing done. Yeah. Uh, okay. Turning over to industry perspectives right now. Uh, I, I do ask almost every oil and gas person I have on the show about this. What mm -hmm. is industries, oil and gas industries perspective on Bitcoin mining right now? Is it, especially with the price plunge, I'm assuming it's still in the early stages, even though there's been a million conversations about it. I think yeah. it's mostly just on Bitcoin Twitter. Uh, are people opening up to it? And specifically in Oklahoma, have you talked to anybody who's drilling wells or operating them or just maybe in the back office and is interested in Bitcoin going forward? So 2020, when I was really trying to put mines on gas wells, uh, those conversations were banging your head against a wall, especially if you wanted to pursue a joint venture. Um, it's totally changed now. Um, maybe I, we've gotten better at Kind of packaging it and and pushing that forwards, but now um, a lot of these guys are interested in it. To give you a perspective of what the demographic distribution in oil and gas looks like, you have it's one of those double humped camels. It's a barbell distribution where the boomers, my father and his generation, are now leaving. They most of them retired in the past couple of years, and you've got kind of uh, not a lot of Gen Xers, but then a lot of millennials. And all my millennial friends who I spent a couple of years trying to study petroleum engineering with, in the past year, almost all of them have reached out to me to talk about this, discovery conversations. I've said that really it takes, you have to kind of uh, want to be in Bitcoin first before you can then figure out how you want to mine Bitcoin off of your existing assets. And so we're probably about a year into um, maybe not the decision makers at these companies, but the the engineers of these companies getting into Bitcoin, who are now in the uh, phase where capital is trying to figure out how to get into oil and gas, finally. And these guys are trying to figure out how to deploy capital. 
And yes, supply chain timelines are going to be longer than they've ever been because of macroeconomics. But these guys are now trying to figure out how to put Bitcoin mines in. And uh, I don't know if they'll be able to convince some of the decision makers, especially at the larger level. G, um, while in some ways well-intentioned, has hamstrung decision making and capital allocation. But I think the smaller mid-sized to small size operators who are drilling wells or or buying uh, existing production and reworking it, those guys are going to figure out how to put Bitcoin mines. And you, so it's really just a matter of fact, it's a matter of marrying um, the ability of how not to get electrocuted out the well site with um, a company that wants to pursue a joint venture. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get electrocuted. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. La- Different question. Actually going to totally pivot away from Oklahoma. So yeah. if anyone's listening and they're like, oh, I'm tired of Oklahoma, here's your part <laughs> of the conversation you might be interested. Yeah. Or if you want to keep listening to Oklahoma, then I guess you'll have to rewind and listen to Charlie again. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about the other mining operations you do, which is more similar to traditional data mining uh, with GPUs. Yeah. What is that like for stranded energy sources? Uh, it's, from my understanding, GPUs can be a lot more finicky than ASICs and require a little bit more operational time, hiring hands to go in there and f- file with all the cards and make sure they're up. Uh, so I'd be curious to get your take on GPU mining using straight energy, but also where you see that market going into this next year as a lot of the coins that you can mine with GPUs are uh, rapidly disappearing, moving to proof yeah. of stake or moving or just drying up. Well, uh, yeah, I uh, one of my partners independently runs one of the larger GPU operations, private ones that I'm aware of. Uh, he's a rock star. And uh, but he's more of an operations guy. Head down, build, keep it online, execute. Um, I spend a lot more time on the well. I wonder where the GPU market's going. Idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, GPU mining doesn't really make sense. Non proof of work or non ASIC mining doesn't really make sense if you're not uh, at the well site or in these remote locations, because. Um, uh, yeah, GPUs, you got to be more finicky, especially if you're kind of bootstrapping this at scale. You don't get to do it optimally, so you got to tinker with it more. ASICs are kind of fire and forget. Hopefully, you do it right. Um, and uh, GPUs, you don't want to be driving two hours out to some, you know, sketchy part of the, the state and to have to go reboot some old motherboards, you know, twice a day. Um, I, yeah. I'm bullish on GPU mining, actually, um, probably more than the some of the people leading the merge are. Just because there's this massive secular growth and demand for compute everywhere you look. Um, I think it's going to have to change a little bit. Maybe you're, you, I, I don't think the guys mining off their two or three GPU rig at home are going to make it. If they're paying retail power rates, it does, it will become a power rate issue. But I think it's like if you've if you're hooked up to any kind of commercial rate, that'll be all right. Um, I think it really comes down to more about diversifying your streams of income uh, from mining with GPUs. So uh, rendering, offsite compute, uh, whatever kind of data storage or like you know remote processing that looks like. But that's going to require you're not going to be able to just watch a YouTube video and make a rig. You, that's going to require you having infrastructure in place um, that you know how to operate optimally and then having some something on the deal flow side to maybe procure the rendering jobs and then and and operate them accordingly. So I think GPU mining will be all right uh, for uh, a while longer. And I'll, I'll, I'll always take the under on them merging uh, on time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Everyone on this podcast do. has. That's that's really yeah. funny. I mean, they'll happening. eventually do it, but it's it's. I just am not going to ever take their their timeline. I'll always say it's going to be longer. So, um, I think yeah, GPU mining is uh, great. And it's a great way, honestly, to get into ASIC mining. Uh, I most of everybody in Tulsa that I talk to who is a miner got their start GPU mining. And I mean, look at you, Will, you know, you used to uh, Ethereum GPU mining guy. Um, and now you lead 
the uh, primarily ASIC mining uh, podcast. So um, it's just there's a low bar- lower barrier of entry. It kind of bootstraps you onto the technical side of things. Uh, I don't I don't poo poo it as much as other people, and but I am biased because a lot of our revenue comes from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. Uh, I think there there's there's gonna be some interesting stuff happening this summer with the GPU market. And uh, I'm curious to see where some public firms like HUD-8 pivot out of GPUs. Yeah, because they just bought, I mean, a few million dollars worth a few months ago. Do they Mm -hmm. know something or is their decision making (laughs) not very optimal? (laughs) Maybe both. I mean, they're swapping right into BTC. So, I mean, I guess it depends on the ETH BTC chart, which has actually held up very well recently. Um, Surprisingly, well, which... Is, is very curious. So we'll see what happens with it. I think I think this summer is actually going to be pretty heated in terms of mining circles. There's some interesting experience with Bitcoin. The merge is coming along. And then uh, maybe we can actually finish up with some of these fire round questions that lead into uh, how spectacular the summer could be. But there's a lot of hash rate coming online, which could lead to some wipeouts possibly. So um, let's do a 30 second fire round to, to finish it out. So this is your your quick takes, you know, the podcast, so, you know, I do these sometimes. Where is hash rate at the end of the year? So three months ago, I published the Nakamoto internal forward looking statement. I said, uh, mm-hmm. top of the range would be 350 X a hash. Um, I think it's going to be lower just because people aren't going to be able to stay online. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say three over 300. I don't think it's going to hit. It might hit 350, but I don't yeah. think it's going to stay at 350. I think we're going to hit some tier or threshold mm-hmm. where the market grows, grows, growth, and then nobody can stay online and we maybe languish for a bit. Yeah. And unless the price of Bitcoin goes to the moon, which that's a whole nother animal. Yeah. I mean, if that happens, that's just like unfair for predictions, but I yeah. hope it does happen. Yeah. yeah 300 is like pretty standard for what we heard beginning of the year. And then I saw some headlines and other people coming on the podcast saying like, eh, we might not hit that. 350 sounds pretty spectacular to me. I mean, there's definitely yeah. a lot of orders to be outstanding, but I think the the biggest issue, as you know, is the hosting supply chain is just really broken right yeah. now. Yeah. I'm going to say 300. I'm pretty confident we'll tag it at the least. 300. Okay. We got you down for that. Oklahoma by end of year. What's the hash rate at, in Oklahoma? Oh, um... One, well, it just depends on some of these guys' timelines Mm because, you know, Northern Data says, ah, we're going to deploy 150 megawatts over the next two or three years. So um, I would say maybe a few exahash. I don't know. I have actually not given this a lot of thought. Three to five. I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. Okay. You got homework now, though. That's good. Yeah, we'll see. As a percentage of, I mean, you did say earlier, like by 2023, end of 2023, Oklahoma and Texas have similar uh, hash rates. So. Yeah, I'm going to, that's the prediction I want to try to, you know, throw out there is that I think we'll have similar hash rates by the end of the decade. Okay. Okay. Uh, I normally don't do this question, but I am kind of curious, what's your Bitcoin price for end of year? What are you modeling out for Nakamoto? Yeah. Well, for those listening, this is on May. 10th the day after mm-hmm. the liquidation cascade <laughs> so i um, gonna caveat that um i was one of those people who was uh i was pretty confident we'd see six figures last year that mm-hmm. didn't happen so this humble pie and this crow tastes a little uh it it doesn't taste as sweet but mm-hmm. um i'm gonna say we have new all-time highs by the end of the year i'm an eternal bull okay. i just uh yeah i'm gonna say new all-time highs Awesome. I like to hear that. We're ending on a bullish note after an awful beginning to the week. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Charlie, I mean, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I don't do leverage. I only DCA. I make that, make that very clear. Oh, true. I'm not uh, technical or skilled enough to keep the leverage stuff going. It always goes over my head. So I don't yeah. touch it. Yeah. But Charlie, thank you so much for coming on the Compass podcast. Really uh, enjoyable conversation about Oklahoma and also Nakamoto. For sure, Will. And love the, love the work y'all do over at Compass. <laughs>